Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 171. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In May of last year, Archbishop Salvatore Cordelione of San Francisco issued a pastoral letter titled, A Pastoral Letter on the Human Dignity of the Unborn, Holy Communion, and Catholics in Public Life. Ten days later, His Excellency was interviewed by an alternative Catholic news source called Currents News. This week, we're going to listen to that five-minute interview and comment on what Archbishop Cordelione said. Here's something I'm going to shout loud and long. During the last two years, every Catholic parish and most businesses lost a ton of money because of the COVID lockdowns. Congress attempted to ease the revenue strain with the CARES Act, but it really did nothing for parishes and little for most businesses. Believe it or not, Congress is actually remedying that. They've not done a good job of getting the word out, but Congress has enhanced the ERTC portion of the CARES Act. If a parish or business has W-2 employees, part-time or full-time, they almost certainly qualify for the ERTC tax rebate. I'm working with a CPA firm that specializes in ERTC rebates to reach out to all parishes and Catholic-owned businesses I can. This is especially good for parishes with schools. All any parish or Catholic-owned business has to do is click the link in my show notes that says ERTC Recovery, I Want My Money. Then just fill out the form on the website and the CPA firm will determine if the parish or business qualifies. It costs nothing to get started and the average tax rebate appears to be $150,000. 
So tell every priest and Catholic business owner about the expanded ERTC rebate and send them to my show notes. Remember, click the link on my show notes that says ERTC Recovery. I want my money. Here's a reminder that in June, the Cantankerous Catholic will host the first annual Toxic Male Month to combat Gay Pride Month, which is a diabolical attack on the Sacred Heart and masculinity in general. We've got quite a lineup of guests for Toxic Male Month, including Bishop Joseph Strickland and Michael Voris. And we'll be doing at least twice as many episodes in June. So make sure to get every man you know, Catholic or not, to listen to the Cantankerous Catholic in June. Currents News is a Catholic alternative news source in Brooklyn, New York. A week and a half after Archbishop Salvatore Cordelione of San Francisco issued a pastoral letter titled, A Pastoral Letter on the Human Dignity of the Unborn, Holy Communion, and Catholics in Public Life, he was interviewed by Currents News about the letter. I'm sorry, but I failed to find out the name of the interviewer. At any rate, Archbishop Cordelione really showed himself to be a man who apparently doesn't have the right stuff, as they say, to be a bishop. After we listen to this five-minute interview, I'll come back to comment on it. While you listen to the interview, see if you can spot the commissions and omissions that make me say Archbishop Cordelione is a coward. It's a question captivating the American church. Should politicians who support abortion rights be denied communion? Biden, who is only the second Catholic president, is the first to hold the office and endorse a pro-abortion agenda. San Francisco's Archbishop Salvatore Cordelione just released a pastoral letter on the issue and joins us now. So, Archbishop, why did you release this pastoral letter? This is a problem that's been vexing the church in our country for a very long time. And uh, I knew... Here in San Francisco, uh, it's, it's such a, a, a place of a secularized culture. I needed to do or say something about this. And I've been pondering what, what would be the best thing to do. And I concluded some time ago that issuing a teaching document such as this would be to clarify the key points about worthiness, trees, holy communion, and uh, the, what the abortion issue really is, and cooperation, and the, the special responsibility of Catholics in public life. All right. I want to read part of the letter you wrote. We all fall short in various ways, but there is a great difference between struggling to live according to the teachings of the church and rejecting those teachings. Talk about that a little bit. Yes, uh, we we have this kind of incongruence now and in, in with not understanding what it means to receive communion. They, many Catholics have a very kind of Protestant notion that it's more like table fellowship, but it means that uh, it's Christ's sacrifice made present to us. We unite our sacrifice with Christ. Dying with Christ means dying to sin. So receiving communion is act by which we profess that we believe what the church uh, believes and we're living our life accordingly. So if we fall, uh, we all fall. That's why we have the other sacrament, reconciliation, so we can be put back in a state of grace. But to uh, intentionally deny any of the church's teaching and receive communion is uh, is a lack of integrity, lack of uh, coherence, Eucharistic coherence. The USCCB currently has a document in the works about whether public figures like President Biden, a Catholic, should stop receiving communion because of their stance on abortion. Under current USCCB policy, decisions on withholding communion are up to individual bishops. So would it be up to you right now to decide if House Speaker Nancy Pelosi should be barred from communion? She's a California Catholic who supports abortion rights. This would be the application of Canon 915. So that, that's in canon law. If someone who's, uh, who is uh, persisting uh, in an obstinate uh, uh, grave sin is not to uh, receive communion or not to be admitted to communion, uh, do not to be admitted to communion, that would be the local bishop would decide for, for his own people. So that's already in the Code of Canon Law. So last week, Bishop Robert McElroy of San Diego told the Jesuit magazine America, the Eucharist is being weaponized and deployed as a tool in political warfare. This must not happen. What's your response to that? 
Well, there are many things to say. Um, if it's to say that it's for a political motive would be really to say to read the minds of those who are taking this stand and know what their motives are. This is not a political motive for me. I intentionally waited until after the election to release it so it would not be misinterpreted as a political move. One could also say that those who are against applying the church's discipline are doing so for a political reason. I would much prefer a, a pro-abortion uh, politician become pro-life than be replaced with a pro-life politician because we grow the camp of those who are pro-life. And also, this has been done in the past. I point out in the pastoral letter the famous example of Archbishop Rummel in New Orleans in the mid-20th century. Civil rights was the issue of their day, as abortion is in our day. He actually excommunicated three uh, Catholics prominent in political life because they were opposing his policy of integrating the schools. And no one sees him as having weaponized the Eucharist. So what is your message to prominent Catholics who promote abortion? I would repeat what I put in the conclusion of the letter to please stop the killing. This is killing innocent human life. Uh, they, you have a very prominent position in society. You can influence societal attitudes and practices. You're in a position to do something to stop the killing. Please stop the killing. Please recognize the evil for what it is. Please have a change of heart and come back to the fullness of your Catholic faith. We await you with open arms to welcome you back. All right, Archbishop of San Francisco, Salvatore Cordelioni, thanks for being here with us today. You're welcome. Thank you. Archbishop Cardelioni is an Orthodox bishop, and I had some pretty high hopes for him when he was moved to San Francisco from Oakland in 2012 by Pope Benedict XVI. I actually felt sorry for him because he'd been moved to America's version of Sodom and Gomorrah. That would mean that he'd really have his work cut out for him if he intended to be a true shepherd. When he first went to San Francisco, he did a few things that added to my hopes for him. As I recall, he banned the use of girls as altar servers, which I think would be especially bold in the city by the bay. He's received a lot of media coverage over the past year for his stand on communion for pro-abort Catholic politicians, which also made me sit up and take notice. However, the past year has significantly changed my opinion of His Excellency. Oh, he's still an Orthodox bishop, all right, but he's sorely lacking in being a shepherd. I've come to believe that he's guilty of sacrilege, and he's a coward and hypocrite. Listening to this review, I've added a liar to my list. Why is Archbishop Cordelioni a coward, hypocrite, and guilty of sacrilege? He's blown smoke for a full year and huffed and puffed about pro-abort Catholic politicians not receiving communion, yet Nancy Pelosi, who lives in the Bay Area, hasn't been told she can't receive communion. She commits a grave sacrilege every time she receives communion, the gravest of all sacrileges. So that makes Archbishop Cordelioni complicit in her sacrilege. Every time she goes to communion in the Archdiocese of San Francisco, by extension, His Excellency is equally guilty of sacrilege because he does nothing to stop her. The reason I've decided that he's a liar is because of what he said about Canon 915. Before we talk about what he said, let me read that canon in its entirety. It says, Those upon whom the penalty of excommunication or interdict has been imposed or declared, and others who obstinately persist in manifest grave sin, are not to be admitted to communion. Archbishop Cordelioni said in the interview that it's up to the individual bishop as to whether he imposes Canon 915. Wait a minute, let's read that canon again. Those upon whom the penalty of excommunication or interdict has been imposed or declared, and others who obstinately persist in manifest grave sin, are not to be admitted to communion. Let's examine that. First of all, it groups those with interdict, excommunication, and manifest grave sin all together. It doesn't separate them. I admit I went to public school, but they did teach me about conjunctions. The word and binds excommunication, interdict, and manifest grave sin together. 
If His Excellency is right, that means it's also up to the local bishop whether to enforce Canon 915 on excommunication and interdict. Now, do you think for one minute that if the Pope excommunicated or interdicted someone, that the local bishop would be allowed to use his discretion regarding Canon 915? That's utterly ridiculous. The second thing is that nowhere in that canon is language that makes its application optional. The exact words of the canon are, not to be admitted to communion. It doesn't say it's up to the bishop. The word is for mandatory application. Okay, maybe I could buy it from a bishop with no canon law experience under his belt. Maybe some bishop ignorant of the gravity of canon law might accept that optional application garbage if he was told by someone he trusts that canon 915 is optional. That's really pretty far-fetched, but it's possible. But what makes it completely impossible with Archbishop Cordelione is that from 1995 to 2002, he served as an assistant at the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Signatura, the Church's highest canonical court. He knows better. It's not an option whether to apply Canon 915 to excommunication interdict or manifest grave sin, and it's a lie to say it is. I don't like to say this about any bishop, but Archbishop Cordelione is a liar. He does what liars do. He lies. There are a number of priests and a few bishops who listen to this show, so I need you to do me a favor. Reach out to Archbishop Cordelione and get him to listen to this episode. Then please tell him to contact me. I'll have His Excellency on this show to defend what he said in the interview and against what I've said here. I'm asking you priests and bishops to do that for me because I invited Archbishop Cordelione on the show last year after he wrote his pastoral letter addressing pro-abort politicians and communion, but he refused to come on. I suppose the yellow in his backbone was showing even then because he was afraid I'd put him on the spot about Canon 915 and its wording. Here's your chance, Excellency. Come on the show and defend yourself. Or am I right in saying that you're just a coward? The COVID lockdowns and mandates hurt everyone financially. Nearly all of you lost money and many lost their jobs. I learned this in email conversations with some of you. I learned that many of you are looking for ways to avoid financial worries when this happens again, and make no mistake that the tyrants in government will make sure it happens again. The number of Americans searching for ways to earn an income online has exploded. Some need to replace the jobs they lost. Others want to build an online income to be prepared for when it happens again. Some just want the freedom from being threatened financially again. Stay-at-home moms want to supplement the household income without working outside the home. I get it. The problem is the average person has no earthly idea where to start. I've been spending countless hours researching ways to earn an online income with the help of some friends. I've come up with a bevy of income avenues and reputable courses to help you. Consequently, I've come up with a separate email list for people who want this information. When I gave this opportunity to people on my other email list, the response was overwhelming. So if you want to get the valuable information I'm collecting about how to make money online, just click on the link in my show notes that says, Show Me How to Make Money. I'll begin helping you right away. Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Sixpack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to the Daily Wire. Pro-life activists last month obtained and reported on the remains of over 100 babies from a Washington, D.C. abortion facility and demanded officials investigate the deaths of five babies who appeared to have been killed after birth. 
the FBI and DOJ arrested and indicted several of the activists. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser on Friday condemned activist Lauren Handy of the progressive anti-abortion uprising, saying she is guilty of extremist anti-abortion activity in the District of Columbia in 2020. Bowser also accused Handy of tampering with the fetal remains she turned into law enforcement last month. No, 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 no! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick pick number four. Hats off to the Daily Wire. The Idaho State Supreme Court temporarily halted a bill banning abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. The temporary stay will remain in effect pending further review of a challenge from Planned Parenthood. The law was expected to go into effect on April 22nd. Send in the Calvary! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick Pick number three. three. Hats off to Fox News. Self-described Catholic Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey has remained silent about New Jersey public school system lessons on gender ideology for children. New education standards set to be enforced this coming fall will require second graders to discuss the range of ways people express their gender. One New Jersey school district distributed sample lessons to teach first graders they can have boy parts but feel like girls. Despicable! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick pick number number two. two. Hats off to the Washington Examiner. The latest CBS News YouGov survey released Sunday found that pretender Joe Biden's job approval rating is still plummeting. Only 42% of U.S. adults gave Biden positive marks in this column. I don't know how so many could have. One point below what he got in February and March, and a far cry from the 62% job approval rating the Democrat got in March 2021. 58% of respondents said they disapprove of the way Biden is handling his job as pretender. Imagine that. That's awesome, dude! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic News, News Pick, Pick number, number one. one. Hats off to the Federalist. Author and activist Kaylee Triller writes, I spent the first 10 years of my life being groomed by a pedophile. I am intimately familiar with the tactics and methods, all of which are brazenly present in much of today's curriculum. That's what I'm talking about. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. I am hard, but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. Last week, we talked about evangelizing Catholics, both active and lapsed. This week, we'll talk about another group of people, then we'll begin talking about how to actually do the work. The other group of people to reach out to are non-Catholics. Most of the non-Catholics I reach out to are cultivated one-on-one. They're the results of general conversations with people I meet, and these are just folks God places in my path. When I'm actively looking for people to evangelize, I use what I call the curiosity approach. The people I use this method on get the totality of Catholic truth just like everybody else. The difference is in the manner of presentation. I learned years ago that the minute you mention the Catholic Church to most people, you can almost hear their minds slam shut. They hate what they believe the Catholic Church to be. 
if the church were like most people think it is, I'd hate it too. But that's because the idea most folks have of the church is nothing akin to reality. So I use the curiosity approach, meaning that it's not until about the fifth lesson that they know or realize I'm teaching them Catholicism. By the time they realize what I'm doing, they're hooked. I've made more than a few converts this way. The inspiration for the curiosity approach came out of the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31, when Paul told the Greeks his notion of who the unknown God was that they'd set up an idol for. I could write more details about the curiosity approach, but I believe just having mentioned it to you without elaboration will get your creative juices flowing. Now let's talk about the various means of evangelization. For the faint of heart, those who are terrified of face-to-face evangelization, you really can evangelize and receive the kudos, admiration, and adulation of any professional full-time lay evangelist. Well, actually you won't get that from any human person, but you will get that from the only person who really matters, God. How? Look, we work for the best boss in the universe. Can't see yourself doing what I do? Then give temporal and financial support to those who do the sort of evangelization I do. Here's a little story to demonstrate what I'm talking about. One day, two men stood outside the parish church after Holy Mass and carried on a conversation. One said to the other, Why, Bill, you put on some weight. Don't you work anymore? I work about 24 hours a day, replied Bill with all seriousness. Impossible, exclaimed his friend. Not with a system, Bill began to explain. I work 12 hours down at the shop and around the house. Then I support mission work. That money works even while I'm sleeping. As is demonstrated in this story, God will give you all of the very same credit, that is, graces, for your financial participation as he does lay evangelists or apostolate doing the actual grunt work. After all, since the foundation of Christianity, one factor has been a constant. Souls cost money. In other words, it costs money to pay for the activities that allow us to reach people. Even Jesus and his merry band of apostles had a purse for expenses. What if you can't make a financial gift? Well, there are two other ways you can still contribute and share in the graces. One example is from the webinars I host. It actually takes at least two people to operate the webinar platform efficiently. For about the first six months I did them, I had to try to manage all of it on my own. That was tough, too, because I'm a real techno moron. But then a man volunteered to help me. He manages the chat moderation when people ask questions while I do the presentations. When the presentation is over, I open the chat moderation to see if there are any questions he couldn't answer. It works out great. So helping someone well-versed in evangelization is a way to evangelize. Another example is from one of my godsons. He's a man who's intellectually challenged in the medical sense, what we used to refer to as mildly retarded. In fact, he was so challenged that the bishop where I lived told me he'd baptize and confirm the man as long as he could articulate what baptism is and what it does, what confirmation is and what it does, and understand the difference between actual bread and the Holy Eucharist. As you'd expect then, most of his friends are like him. He wanted to share the faith in the worst way. At the time, I was teaching a small group and served them coffee and cookies. Since my godson couldn't competently tell his friends what the Catholic Church teaches, he just invited his friends to come have a cup of coffee and a snack. Then he left the rest up to the Holy Spirit. Several of his friends became Catholics. Now, if my intellectually challenged godson could do it, I know you can. The second way to evangelize is very closely akin to what my godson did. Find a group where evangelization is done, maybe a St. Paul Street evangelization chapter, or even a good RCIA class, which are far and few between. 
Work up a little pitch to present to people you know or meet, a little thing designed to get them committed to listening to someone share the faith in all its purity and splendor, but make sure it's unadulterated Catholicism absent of milk toast, because watered-down catechesis never attracts anyone. Once they commit to listen, make sure you go with them. You be their contact and friend while the lay evangelist does the work. There's a third way to evangelize, and we'll pick up on that next week. Next week, we'll also give you an easier, more organized way to learn the faith as well as you need to know it in order to evangelize. The lockdowns over the last two years have changed the way people earn or want to earn a living. A lot of people are wanting to set up online businesses for themselves in e-commerce. The problem is, most folks have no earthly idea how to start, and all the videos on YouTube that are supposed to tell you how to begin just whet your appetite. Well, now you can get the help you need. Peter Prue, a successful e-commerce entrepreneur, is the founder of E-Commerce Empire Builder Academy. He's offering a free webinar that explains how he's made a full-time living in e-commerce and what his academy's all about. So if you want to learn how to set up an online e-commerce business, click the link in my show notes that says E-Commerce Empire Builder Academy and register for the free webinar. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. Francis de Sales. He said, Anxiety is the greatest evil that can befall a soul except sin. God commands you to pray, but he forbids you to worry. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. On July 6, 1902, a tragedy took place on a farm near Neptuno, Italy. An innocent Italian girl, Maria Goretti, had long been bothered by a youth who was attracted to her beauty. With untiring patience, she continued to reject his advances until one day the boy in a mad passion seized a knife and attacked her. Her mother rushed to her side. My little Maria, what happened? Who was it? It was Alessandro. Look what he did to me. But why? Then came the answer that made Maria worthy of a martyr's crown and has ranked her with St. Agnes because he wanted me to do wrong, and I wouldn't let him. To the same kind of question later on, she replied, because he wanted me to commit a horrible sin, and I said to him, no, no, no. Maria was taken to the hospital, where she remained only two days before she finally died. A priest came to her and said, Maria, do you forgive your murder from your heart? Yes, came the quick response. For the love of Jesus, I forgive him, and I want him to be with me in paradise. In her delirium, she relived the tragedy of the previous day. She thought she saw the face of Alessandro and cried in terror. What are you doing, Alessandro? Don't touch me. You're going to hell. These were her last words, a protest against sin and a warning to the sinner. Maria was beautiful in the majesty of death. She died a martyr to chastity as truly as St. Agnes had in the second century. The example of St. Maria Goretti should teach you to hate impurity and be ready to die rather than offend God by committing any sin against purity. The use of sex outside the purpose and plan of God and nature is grievously wrong. Sex is only to be used in marriage. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.